Welcome to Bible class. on your word from Revelation 4 and 5 this morning. Grant us wisdom by that word that we may be faithful witnesses to the goodness that you have shown us. Lord Jesus, we pray in your name. Amen. Amen. All right. Uh, for the sake of time, I'm going to read a couple things here, but then I'll, I'll need you, you folks that have microphones at your tables. I'll need you to be not staring at each other. So if I ask it, if I ask a table, as well, in order to get through this work, we're going to need you to um, be active participants and willing readers. All right. Um, the vision. So John gives a unique vision of heaven in chapters four and five. This vision will not only gives John a better understanding of the reign and rule of Christ, but it also, it also sets up for us the content and direction of the rest of the book of Revelation. Right? Um, it's going to, well, well, we'll talk to you again. I'm going to skip some stuff for the, sake, for the sake of time. Let's go down to historical considerations. Um, the purpose of the vision is to demonstrate the enthronement and exaltation of Jesus Christ, the Lamb who was slain. Okay, now I'm on to the probably the next page in your study guide. Um, when did the enthronement of Jesus Christ, pictured in Revelation 4 and 5, take place? The best answer appears to be that it took place at the ascension of the Lord Jesus Christ, for the following reasons. <coughs> it certainly, it is certain that it took place after the suffering and death of the resurrection of Jesus, for the victorious Lamb appears in the scene as one who has been slain, but is now alive. The scriptures reveal that Jesus would come into, in heaven, into his heavenly glory after his resurrection. In his intercessory prayer for his disciples, John 17, also called the high priestly prayer, Jesus prays that they may finally may be with him and see his glory, a reference to the glory at the right hand of God in his heavenly majesty. In the accounts of the transfiguration, the glory of the Christ which was displayed was the glory that he would come into after his death and resurrection. <coughs> Just before Stephen was led away to his martyrdom, he looked up into heaven by the Spirit and saw Jesus Christ in glory at the right hand of God at seven. Next paragraph. Revelation 4 and 5. And you know this is, should be italicized in your study. 
Revelation 4 and 5 are a dramatization of the exaltation of Jesus Christ at the right hand of God as it appeared from heaven's view. Now this is interesting. I found it so. Um, would somebody turn to Acts chapter 1? So somebody at this table over here on my left, Acts chapter 1, 6 two through 11, I'm going to give that to you. Okay, let me read this again. So Revelation 4 and 5 are a dramatization of the exaltation of Jesus at the right hand of God as it appeared from heaven's view. The descriptions of Acts 1, 6 through 11 is from the perspective of those on earth. We thus have two complementary visual descriptions of Christ's ascension. Would somebody over there read Acts 1, 6 through 11? So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, It is not for you to know the times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. When they had said these things, they were looking on. He was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. And while they were gazing into heaven, as he went, behold, two men stood by them in white robes and said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will come in the same way that you saw him go into heaven. Thank you very much. So I, that was helpful for me. And again, this is a book that I haven't loved and spent piles of time in because I just struggle with all the symbolic, all the symbolic language. So, but... You know, we're digging deeper into it here, but that was really helpful for me. And I also would say, we're going to host, by the way, uh, our circuit for the last decade plus has uh, had a joint Ascension cir ascension Day service. We're going to host it this year back at St. Paul's. Um, and that had me thinking, maybe we'll read four and five for Ascension Day. That would be, you know, why not? Um, that would be fun. So the description of Acts Six or Acts one, six to eleven, from the, is from the perspective of those on earth. And with four and five, we have a complementary vision from the side of heaven, as it were. Okay. Um, so, middle of the last paragraph. In reality, Jesus' coronation, by which he was created, he created a kingdom for God, and by which he himself became king, was at his suffering and death. Okay. Now. Um, I'm also going to just kind of commend to your reading for the sake of time here, because I really, I, I want us to spend time in Revelation 4 and 5. But if you look um, on your study sheet, comparing the Revelation vision to Old Testament visions in heaven, it lists and references there for you. If you didn't look at those, whether from Ezekiel 1 or Isaiah 6 or Daniel 7, I would encourage you to do that. There are some... There are some similarities and differences, and your study guide notes that for you. I will note in particular the third one. Again, not for the sake of time, I'm reading some of this for you this morning. The Revelation throne scene is the only explicitly Christological scene, while the Old Testament focuses more on God the Father. This is not surprising, however, since in the Old Testament, the Christ, the Son of Man, had not yet come into his messianic glory although he appears in the Daniel scene, if you look at that, okay? So, uh, middle table. If one of you would read that paragraph on theological considerations, and then, uh, over on the right here, Dorothy Chuck, your table, somebody, I'm gonna have you guys read through the key insights for Ephesians 4, and then back over here, somebody in this row take, is somebody's gonna do uh, Revelation 4, 1 through 6a, okay? So go ahead and read the Theological Considerations paragraph. The heavenly vision of the coronation of Jesus after the ascension to the right hand of the Father is highly symbolic and can seem confusing to modern readers. For millennia, commentators and scholars have been trying to interpret every detail of the vision and mine it for meaning. For this study, we will read through the whole vision but not linger on every detail. Instead, we will take a broad view of the vision pointing out significant details and considering what this shows us about Jesus' reign and rule in the end times. Okay. Would somebody over there read the key insights for us? And then somebody over here is getting, read, getting ready to read Revelation 4, 1 to 6a. Thank you very much. 
the key insights for Revelation 4, 1 to 6a? Yep. Okay. 4 verse 1. The open door in 4 verse 1 represents the idea that John was given a special grace of looking into heaven, which is ordinarily closed and forbidden to the human eye to view the heavenly glory of God. The trumpet-like voice is the exalted Son of Man. The exalted Christ is the mediator of the vision of God's heavenly glory, and is until Revelation 8 verse 1, when angels take over the mediation. In 4, 2, and 3, through the identification of precious stones in verses 2 and 3, is somewhat uncertain. The impression that they connote and reflect is unmistakable, even as light flashes through and from them with beauty and brilliance, so do the majesty and glory of God flash forth from the appearance of the one seated on the throne. The rainbow mentioned in verses 2 to 3 reminds us of Noah and was a visible sign or proof that God would bless the earth so that it would never cease to sustain life. It became a sign that re reminded God's people of his mercy, which covered their sins. It is thus God's majestic mercy that the rainbow-like halo signifies. The three precious stones, jasper, sardius, and emerald, were also part of the breastplate of Israel's high priest, in Exodus 28, verses 15 to 21. There were 12 stones in all, representing the 12 sons of Israel. Wearing these stones, the high priest represented Israel before God as he offered sacrifice for atonement. Thus, like the rainbow, the references to these stones suggest God's mercy towards his people. Chuck, you wanna take the others? <laughs> Though the elders in 4.4-4 4. 4 <coughs> wear white garments similar to that of the angels, the fact they are sitting on a throne and wearing crowns and indicates that they are not angels, but instead elevated saints of God. The crown that the Lord wears signifies victory. Likewise, God's saints, when elevated, will wear crowns that signify the victory that the Lord Christ won for them and shares with them. If the elders are saints of God, why the number 24? John would have understood them to be representatives of the people believing of God for both the Old Testament and New Testament saints. From the perspective, the number 24 is best explained as the elders, patriarchs, of the 12 tribes of Israel, who represent saints from the Israel of old before God's heavenly throne, and the 12 apostles who represent saints from the Israel of the New Testament period. These elders pictorially represent the heavenly Jerusalem. 4.5. The lightning flashes around the throne of four five are reminiscent of the thunder and lightning that accompanied God when he met Moses and the children of Israel at Mount Sinai. The presence of the Holy Spirit is signified by the seven lamps of fire. Four six. The Christ-like stillness of the sea, four six, reminds John that, <clears throat> that what happened separated him from the glory of God's presence. The turmoil of his sin and God's judgment as represented by a turbulent ocean. Is still is now still and quiet because Christ has conquered Satan. Excellent. If everybody would be in Revelation four now, um, so you can see there's a paragraph break halfway through um, chapter verse six, and so we want to read through for, verse uh, Revelation four six a. Go for it. After this, I looked, and behold, a door standing open in heaven. And the first voice which I heard speaking to me like a triumph or a trumpet said, Come up here, and I will show you what must take place after this. At once I was in spirit, and behold, a throne stood in heaven, with one seated on the throne. And he who sat there had the appearance of Jasper and Carolinian, and around the throne was a rainbow that had the appearance of an emerald. Around the throne were 24 thrones, and seated on the thrones were 24 elders, clothed in white garments with golden crowns on their heads. From the throne came flashes of lightning and rumbling and perils of, heaven, of thunder, and before the throne were burning seven torches of fire, which are the seven spirits of God. And before the throne there was as it were a sea of glass like crystal. Excellent, thank you very much. So, what what details thus far stand out to you? Jasper's red. Jasper's red? Carnelian's red. 
Yeah, and I would say, if you go, you read the commentators on this, historical, they go deep into the weeds. We're not going to go deep into the weeds. Um, I mean, I mean it, it, people go, I mean, this, yeah, anyway, yeah, so those things, yes. What else? We, you know, this is moved by the Spirit, so this is not just a uh, like a verbatim account, right? This, so this, this is the Lord led all this, but yeah, there are some things like He's describing. It looks like it's emerald and jasper and carnelian and, and rainbows. And yeah, clouds. interesting that some of those were on the breastplate of the high priest, which you know, I, yeah. all of this is. Fascinating. Other things, yeah. Oh, yes. Other, what are, any other things that stuck out thus far? Well, let's then go on to the next. Let's go on to the next part, because this get, this is this is some this, this chapter four and five is some of the richest it is some of the rich richest imagery in the life of the church that is used regularly in worship for centuries. Russ. Could you explain the seven spirits of God? Thank you. We're going to take that, uh, and this goes back to lesson one and two also. The, the seven spirits of the seven, the seven number of completeness, we believe that most of this is referenced, a, a way of speaking about the Holy Spirit. The sevenfold, sevenfold spirit, the, 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 fullness of, the fullness of the spirit. Does that help? Right. Um, and again, there's all kinds of, you, you go, if you go on the internet and search this, which I don't recommend, <laughs> um, I mean, really, I, don't, I really don't. Uh, if you go on the internet and search this, you'll get, I mean, you'll, you, yeah, you just get the weeds. Um, this is, it's, you know, it's one of the reasons, this thing, this thing is helpful, if, and I, I, I've touted this before, I, I don't like where the, ma I'm starting, I don't, this is the, the new, newer, the Lutheran Study Bible, English Standard Version. I like my maps readily available. Um, some of the maps in here are buried in the midst of the in the midst of the text, and you have to know them. But this is the this is the first English Lutheran Study Bible built from the ground up by by conventional Lutherans. The other stuff that we had before were edits of of Bibles that were originally built, like the previous Concordia Self-Study Bible, which is a nice Bible. The NIV, the, that original NIV is not, it's a fine translation. Um, but that was diff a, a different Christian church body did the initial notes and then we edited and changed stuff. Um, this, is the, this is the first English study Bible built from the ground up by Luther. So, you know, the it makes it makes all the notes and stuff a little bit more trustworthy because some you know you buy some you can buy some other study Bible at a Christian bookstore and you're likely going to get from a very different perspective on, on Revelation in particular and I'm you know, I'm gonna I'm gonna pause there this is a different type of literature and what. It reflects a type of thinking and speaking that where you say things again and again in different ways. It's, cir it's circular, um, which is common in, in the East to this day. And if you weren't here, that's why, you know, my wife Carrie, when, when I was back in the seminary in the late 90s, when she was typing a dissertation of a friend of ours uh, who fr from India, I mean, it was just maddening because he kept saying the same thing right, over and over again in different in different ways. Lord <laughs> mercy, right? You know, um, and we had to help it or not. You know, all right, yeah, you're writing for you're writing for English speaking Americans. We kind of want to go from one point to the next. So this revelation, but we we have to get ourselves into this mindset of. We're going to say, you know, this is, especially as we move forward in study, it's going to say it again and again and again in different ways. All right, let's go to the next part, and I'm going to read these notes quickly, and I'm going to ask somebody at the middle table to do 6B through 11 in a minute.
Okay? I'll read the insights. 4, 6b through 8. Though there have been different interpretations of them throughout history, the winged creatures described in Revelation 4, 6 through 8 are best interpreted as a particular order of angels. Their task is to lead the heavenly host in the praise and adoration of God. The number four suggests the totality of God's animate creation. The man, and notice the could, you're, you're, end up, you're speculating, the man could represent the human race, the lion, the animal kingdom, the ox, domesticated animals, the eagle, the birds of the air. Though they can be ascribed symbolic meaning, they exist in their own right. They are properly representatives of God's total creation and worship before his heavenly throne. 4, 8, 4, 8 through 11. It is best to interpret the hymn of verses, 4, of verses 8 through 11 as the hymn by which all the heavenly host praises God. The church on earth, even in suffering, also sings this hymn triumphantly in faith. And especially the bride of Christ in heavenly triumph sings and will continue to sing this great hymn of praise. As the winged creatures continually or in intervals sing, the 24 elders representing the entire people of God sing a stanza that praises God as their creator. As an act of worship, the 24 elders cast their, crown, their golden crowns before God's throne, indicating that they share in Christ's victory only because of God's mercy and grace. So whoever would read uh, Revelation 4, 6b through 11, go for it. We had, a, we had a taker? All right, come on, we weren't going to do this, remember? Okay. Somebody help me. That's it. <laughs> Thank you. Dale's got it. You got it. And around the throne, on each side of the throne, are four living creatures, full of eyes in front and behind. The first living creature like a lion, the second living creature like an ox, the third living creature with the face of a man, and the fourth living creature like an eagle of flight. And the four living creatures, each of them with six wings, are full of eyes all around and within. And day and night they never cease to say, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Thank you very much. Uh, through 11. Through 11, sorry. Yep. And whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who is seated on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him who is seated on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever. They cast their crowns before the throne, saying, Worthy are you, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and by your will they existed and were created. Thank you very much. So our question then is, what does this section reveal to you about worship in heaven? And what does this have to do with worship today? Excellent question. What does this reveal about worship in heaven? And what does this have to do with worship today? It's never ceasing. It's never ceasing. Which should be our lesson. <laughs> which is a key lesson, yep. But that's what we should also be doing. It shouldn't just be in heaven, it should be here on earth. That's the first commandment. There is, yeah, there is perpetual, there is perpetual worship before the Lord, for sure. You can see with all this imagery, right, and if you haven't really read Revelation before, you can totally get into the weeds and make up all, do all kinds of stuff. Um, Carrie was telling me that, some, you know, there's the, you know, with these AI programs, these artificial intelligence programs, they're doing some really funky artwork. Wasn't that you I heard saying that? I thought it was you. Somebody, uh -oh. she's looking at me like, oh, I don't know. Um, <laughs> all right. Well, anyway, I heard from somebody. Uh, <laughs> you created Olaf? Yes, because I couldn't, I didn't want to pay to license him. For Who is Olaf? Snowman. Oh, they created Olaf. No, I created Olaf for a walk because I didn't want to license the Disney picture of Olaf. Oh, okay. So I just created him using AI. No kidding. Yes. 
Well, how about, how about that? Just tell it what you wanted to do and it. Okay. I have a question, Pastor. Yes, ma'am. As I was hearing this yesterday, I when when you get there in in the, in the paragraph of the Heavenly Court on page 27, it talks about the total creation creation in worship. And I was thinking of my friends who have pets. When you look at you know you've got all the other guys, the animals and whatever else. What? Can we expect, I, it says it, I think. There's a new creation, there's all kinds of evidence. I don't want to, I don't want to say some exactly. definitive thing. No, but. Are you, are you, I mean, are you going to see your resurrected beloved cat I, in heaven? I don't um, I was thinking of what you just now about all the bugs I smashed. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, remember, we're not Hindus, so we don't think we're, you know, okay. killing creatures. Yes. Life. It's describing. It's right. saying it was an ox. It was like an ox. Yep. Yeah. I, again, I, we, it does. It does. It does say it. It's like an ox. But there's also this. There's also lots of language about the new creation. Um, the, the, the man represents the human race. The lion and the animal kingdom. Ox domesticated. Again, it's the scripture that's authoritative, not the explanation. <laughs> yes. they, 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 they keep reference to our, the same hymn being sung over and over. Right. Is there any any revelation? Well, and we tells us what the hymn is. Well, in, it, it's holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Ever heard that before in worship? <laughs> right. Yeah. I mean, when do we when do we do that? Clap your hands. When do we when do we do when do we say holy? Think about it. when do we say holy, holy during the, during the service of the sacrament? Isn't that marvelous? Because Christ is present. I love the I love the addition of the new Dominus that we did uh, that we do. You know the Song of Simeon. Um, but you, we have this language that we use from here. It's rich um, that because we are in the we we believe. That Christ is actually present, and we use the we use the same type of we use the same language of Revelation. It also echoes um, Isaiah six um, of uh, of his his vision of worship. You know, holy, 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 Lord God of Sabaoth, right? The hell, whole heavenly host. All right, we're going to run out of time. Let's go to the next one. Um, all right. Oh, Lord, we're not going to be able to do all this. Okay, i tell you what. I want to read 5, 1 to 7 first, and then I'll go through some of the stuff that I highlighted, and we'll, that's what we'll just have to do. So, um, somebody on my left hand, as it were over here, pass it around whoever wants to take it. Revelation 5, 1 to 7, please. Then I saw in the right hand of him who was seated on the throne a scroll written within and on the back sealed with seven seals. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice who is worthy to open the scroll and break the seals. And no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look into it. And I began to weep loudly because no one was found worthy to open the scroll or to look into it. And one of the elders said to me, weep no more. Behold, the lion, the tribe of Judah, of the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David has conquered so he can open the scroll and its seven seals. And between the throne and the four living creatures and among the elders I saw a lamb standing as though it had been slain with seven horns with seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. And he went and he took the scroll from the right hand of him who was seated on the throne. Thank you very much. All right. Um, Let's look at the let's look at some of the insights. So five from insights from five one and following. The seals seals offer security and keep the content safe from unlawful usage. I thought that was this was interesting. It was practice in Roman civil law for a last will and testament to be sealed with seven seals. It's interesting. Right? So is it one scroll with seven seals? That's what it appears. That's yeah. Again, it, it be second and under five four. It becomes evident as the Lamb opens each seal that the content of the scroll is the message that is made known to John. The contents 
of chapters 6 through 22. That'll be for this again, four and five are going to point us forward. So I, 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 yeah. vision, I vision like, you know, you roll up paper, right? And you get the, you get the rippling, um, you know, one page is shorter, longer. So like one, the first seal would open up the first part of the scroll, and then the second seal, I would yeah this it, it would it would be a, it would be an it would be an it would be interesting I mean that would be a whole different Bible study and an interesting one as such of faithful artistic interpretations of all this stuff I mean that you know um, yeah it'd be interesting that would be that would be interesting so but I mean overwhelming images here. The ultimate purpose, so the middle of that paragraph, the ultimate purpose of Christ receiving the scroll and then revealing its contents to John and the church is to strengthen the church's faith and to encourage the church, even in the midst of suffering, to remain faithful to Christ and so attain to the promise of glory. This is, this is for me, as a sometimes stupefied reader of Revelation. <laughs> Very helpful. The purpose is not to confuse and for speculation, um, and we'll see this in the text itself. The purpose uh, is to strengthen the church and the church's faith and to encourage the church, even in the midst of suffering, to remain faithful to Christ. And you, you know, you think about that we, where we started, at the beginning in chapter 4, you have this, you know, the, this vision of the ascension where we have it in Acts chapter 1, for example, we see it from our perspective. This gives it the, for, from heaven's pr perspective. And, and as a couple of, you know, several of you have noted already, this is done as, you know, there's in a vision to John and how he, how he sees it, but it's coming from a different perspective. And I think, I suspect all of us especially any of us who have been parents of more than one child, can appreciate, or anybody who's been an employer and had to supervise people, appreciates the, the multiple perspectives. Because, and again, any of you who had more than one child, there'll be something that happens. And you'll ask the one, and you'll hear something. And then you ask the other. Oh, yeah, I can hear the smiles. We're resonating here. You, you listen to the other, and you get something slightly different. And part of your job is to try and put this together. It's, so it's, it's helpful to see this you know, revelation as kind of a from a symbolic heavenly perspective that helps give us some insights in this. Um, Yes, ma'am. You have an added comment. Edit. An edit. Added we'll tell you, if you've got an edit, don't do the edits to me by email or something. Um, that Because, yeah, again, this is going for CPH. All right? 5-6, which I'll read again. And between the throne and the four living creatures and among the elders, I saw a lamb standing as though it had been slain with seven horns, with seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. The one who would be worthy to open the scroll would be Jesus, the Lamb who was slain. The victory is won by Christ, the Lamb, in his death on the cross and resurrection. It is a victory that is shared with his faithful followers, the people of God. The seven horns and the seven eyes symbolically represent how the Lamb has authority to oversee everything by the Holy Spirit because of his victory. Um, how does this, this scene here how does the revelation that this scene is an alternative picture of the ascension help you think about the person and the work of Jesus? Thoughts on this? How does this, as an alternative picture of the ascension of Jesus, how does how does it help you think of Jesus? Thoughts? Okay. Yeah, Laura. He has power and control over everything. Power and authority over everything, and then we're definitely going to get into that into the next set into the next session. Um, 
Oh, I'm sorry, Mike. Yeah. Is after his resurrection and crucifixion. Sorry, I didn't get you. you is after his crucifixion and resurrection. Is after his crucifixion and resurrection. Yep. Um, this is right. This is one of those things we we often will picture. You know we. I think it, we, we often think of Jesus in more human terms. It's, I think it's helpful to see this. He is ruling presently now. Yes? But that picture is not a very pleasant picture. <laughs> <laughs> right? Yeah, there are, yeah, the other, there are other, yeah. There's a lot of this. That, yeah, it's, it's weird. Explain yourself here. But it's seven eyes and seven horns coming out of a lamb. I mean, <laughs> I mean, it's you know, a little weird. every other picture that's depicted of a lamb in the Bible is this cute little lamb. Yeah, right? I wonder how many stained glass windows there are of this. Well, I'm just thinking, this is, you know, again, this is, I was just talking to Micah, you know, there's these marble, you know, the, the worthy who can pick up Thor's hammer and so on, but it reminds me also of that scene in Avengers, you know, where... Um, he flips, uh, uh, Loki. He flips Loki back and forth and says, puny God. You know, clearly, what's going on here, we can't even put language to it. Right? Right. You know, like, our heads cannot wrap around what's being seen. And so anything we try and just describe, or we just don't even have the language to fully right. describe it. It's difficult right. to fully describe it. Yes, George. I have a little different perspective, I guess, on this thing. Please. Um, because first of all, uh, Christ is not sitting at the right hand of God in this particular picture. Yep. He's down in between. And then you have the Father. Do me, do me a favor for a video. Use the microphone since you've got it right in get that battle. Is it dead? Yeah. Oh, good. So then the picture is, the picture is God handing the scroll down to the Son. Yep. Okay, and as he's opening those, because he's the only one that can, this is like the the beginning of the end. You know, you have famine, you have everything like that. As he opens up those scrolls, so it's, at least that's the way I picture it. Sure. George, it's, it's, it's about it, it, finding comfort in the reign of Christ. You want to pass George, it back to Paul? Yeah. Don't, don't fall. <laughs> yeah, don't follow me. Okay, so a different idea on the lamb. You see a, a regular old lamb, oh, that, you know, that's cute. You see a lamb with seven eyes and seven horns, that's going to make you take notice, I think. <laughs> as, 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 it, as it has. As it has. As it has. <laughs> yes, ma'am. And he was going to go to prepare a place for us. Yes. And that there would be many mansions. Yes. So he had a job to do. And to me, this shows an administrative protocol <laughs> of things that needed to happen. As he was returned to his father. Before, for the record, this is a church secretary. <laughs> Former. Former church secretary. But yeah. there's an order to things. Yeah. It wasn't he just went up there and started construction. <laughs> yeah. But there's, um, there's a formality, so there's no doubt of who is assigned the task. Let's do the remainder, let's do the remainder of five. Because um, we've got a little bit of time here. There's so much here. Um, but again, you can see how all this symbolic language, I mean, you could spend, you could really be in, you could really get into the weeds here. And, you know, I mean, you could make for some fun art, art projects in the school. Um, maybe not with first graders. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Um, would somebody take a mic that's working and read uh, Revelation 5, 8 through 14? I got it. Thank you. And when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the Lamb, each holding a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song, saying, Worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals. 
For you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed people for God, from every tribe and language and people and nation. And you have made them a kingdom and priests to our God, and they shall reign on the earth. Then I looked, and I heard around the throne and the living creatures and the elders the voice of many angels, numbering myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain, to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. And I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea, and all that is in them, saying, To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb, be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. And the four living creatures said, Amen, and the elders fell down and worshipped. Love it. Uh, so, Handel's Messiah. Yeah. Yes, Cheryl. I have a, um, a commentary in this. In, I have a commentary in my Bible, which is, uh, um, I don't know what it is, but it, it's, it's a women's study Bible, English Standard Version, and this commentary was written by somebody named Robert A. Peterson. But it, it's, um, it's interesting because it's more along the lines, and I did not read this until just now, but it's more along the lines of what I was thinking uh, the interpretation could be of mm -hmm. the four, the lion, the ox, the man, and the bird. Mm -hmm. um, it's, I don't know, it's too long to read, I think. But it, can I read a little? Well, you are. <laughs> in, in his vision, John weeps in frustration because no one could be found worthy to open the sealed scroll revealing God's purposes for history. However, one of the elders tells John to stop crying and announces that a worthy one had indeed been found, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David. The people of God have numerous enemies more powerful than they, sin, death, Satan, demons, and hell. Christ is the Lion from Judah, the mighty conqueror of our enemies. He overcame them in his death and resurrection. God's grace through faith, we enjoy the fruits of Jesus' victory, knowing God now and sharing the life with him and all the people of God in the new earth forever. As the root of David, Jesus is a royal descendant of King David. Though John expects to see the Lion, instead he sees a Lamb standing as though it had been slain. Paradoxically, the Lion is the Lamb. Christ is both our champion and the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Um, the Lamb slain, Revelation's most common symbol for Christ, speaks of him giving himself in death as a sacrifice to redeem us from our sins. Seven horns and the seven eyes symbolize that Christ is all-powerful and all-knowing. When the Lamb takes the scroll from God, a song of redemption breaks out in heaven. Worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed people for for God. So it goes on a little bit, but that was more of what we were just talking about. Yep. So. I, I like this first this first note on five nine, and let's read. Um, Worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. If you have made them a kingdom and priests to our God, and they shall reign on the earth. With the, here's what the note says in your, in your lesson. With the singing of the hymn of praise to the Lamb, we see the greatest scene of adoration in all of the biblical writings. For it is through the worship of the Lord Christ that the Heavenly Father receives his highest glory from his saints. In 5.9, the hymn is called New. Because it has never been sung before, the hymn expresses why the Lamb is worthy to receive all the praise. As the child is noted, with his blood, he ransomed for God a people from all quarters of the human race. There's also a reference to the kingdom of priests, right? That we, I, th I think we know this in our bones. Um, you know, again, this I think is at the root of every culture's interest in superheroes that we know that we're not just nothing. I, th I think, you know, this, it, it speaks to we are, we are built as God's children um, with, with power and authority and yes, and yes humility, but, but made, made to reign. Um, and this, you know, getting getting into stuff that's more clear, you know, in Romans. This is this is why Paul 
salams Adam in Romans 1 and Romans 5. Because he was built to, he, he was made to reign, to protect, to preserve, and he abandoned his post. And the whole kit and caboodle was laid at his feet. Whereas by the one, all sin came, by the new Adam comes life, right? All right, let's go to, um, well, answer that question. How do we echo the language of those around the throne in our worship of Christ? The Sanctus, okay, yeah. How do we how do we do that? At the end at the end of this commentary, he says, "This is our future. Let us take heart and enjoy the great hope that is ours." Right. Well, it's yeah. This is part of the point. It's not just our future. It's also our present. present. Yeah. It's yeah. also our present. Yeah. I'm not hearing a lot of like I language and, and feeling stuff. Well, you Lord, know? I just pray. Yeah. It, it's you know the whole focus is on Christ and what He has done. There it right, and, and that's. Yeah. I was, I was, there is, it, it is, it is, it is Christocentric, Christocentric, it gives glory, it gives glory to God in all things. Uh, let's answer another question, okay, go to the consider. Um, how are, how are Christians today tempted by the devil, the world, and our sinful flesh, flesh to believe that Jesus is not reigning? and in complete control of our eternal futures. How can we encourage one another to remember and cling to the reality depicted in this reading about Jesus' reign and rule? How are we tempted? And, and how can we um, encourage one another to remember that Christ reigns? Thoughts? Well, it sounds like bad things happen. Right. Well, I, you know, why does God let why does God let you know, why does God let bad things happen? Which um, is not necessarily an unfaithful question. I mean, you know, open the Psalms. But it you'll, you'll, gives people the sense that they've been abandoned. Yep. You can't. Yeah. You, so yeah, and it's it's interesting because you can. You know, Psalm fifty one is a great example of this, um, but there's a host of them. You know, Psalm 51, written by David after the adultery with Bathsheba. Um, you get that word, Psalm 90 by Moses, one of you know one of my favorites. Very solemn. Um, you know, life is difficult. Uh, in the end, but at the end, of, but at the end of it, is this? There's this confidence, and that's um, you know, Pam. That's my sense is is that what your that's what your comments pointing at is in. In the, in the midst of the trial and tribulation that we have, we, we claim Christ reigns. And this is why Revelation is, is intended to be an encouragement to us. He reigns. It may not seem like it. You know, we're, I don't know how we're going to get through this. It may, it may seem like, you're, you, God, you've just abandoned me. But I know, you, I know you reign. God, help me to believe it and trust it. My hope is built on nothing less. Reminds me of the old youth group song, Our God is an awesome God. Right. Yep. Yeah. Um, what comes to my mind is dialogue between the children and his wife. Yes. Curse God. And die. And die. Right? Why don't you just curse God and die? And his response, and his response is? The Lord give us the Lord take it away. Yeah. Yep. Even in bad times we're blessed. Yeah. Even in bad times we're blessed. Yep. It, you know, that's... Thank you for that. Thank you for that example, because that is that is one of the great in the scriptures, isn't it? That Job, you know, the Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Um, yes, and sometimes you want to go. I've had enough. <laughs> right? Yes. Go. There's a little uh, things in here that are kind of shout out. You know, we're taught about the Trinity and the Holy Spirit and how God works through the Holy Spirit. All of a sudden, there are seven spirits. And this is the world we live in where they want to have a spirituality for a yeah. rock. Again, the sevenfold spirit is intended as symbolic for the Holy Spirit because seven is the number of holy. But what are the seven spirits that they're sending out? They're 
Okay. Well, again, that's what I say. So this is symbolic language. The seven spirits is that represents the the full the the, the fullness of the Holy Spirit, not just seven ethereal things. It tries to be, break down the creation into segments of the creatures that were created and give them each a spirit. Yeah, some people do all kinds of different stuff with this. The way again, the way we're taking it is the sevenfold spirit is. Is, is symbolic of the Holy Spirit. It's a way to speak of the Holy Spirit. I've got to get upstairs and lead worship. Um, this is the lesson for next week. So before you leave, I want you to come pick one of these up, and then you've got it. We've got it for next week. Again, my recommendation is you get yourself a three ring binder, and then you can keep all this stuff. So let's pray, and then uh, I will be on my way. Worthy are you, Lord. Because you are the lamb that was slain and is raised from the dead. Help us to remember, even in the midst of trial and even when it seems like that you've abandoned us, that you reign, you rule, and you will never forsake your children, including each and every one of us. Grant us your peace and blessing this day. And by faith, may we follow wherever you lead. Lord Jesus, we pray in your name. Amen. God bless you all. Have a great day. Thanks for coming.